It's easy to see what happens when understanding and compassion between parties breaks down. We have Ferguson, Missouri, and similar situations that mirror it. And we see disrespectful behaviors on social media. We all have learned how quickly a situation can ignite if the trust between constituencies breaks down. Learning to purposefully build respect, listening with compassion, and trying to understand different perspectives are life skills that you will practice here at Trinity and will take you way beyond Trinity when you graduate. On November 30th, 2012, was the day that we were supposed to receive our Quest Bridge notices, whether we got the scholarship or not. I believe it was the Trinity um, College admissions uh, person, and they said, congratulations, you just matched for Quest Bridge, you're going to Trinity. And at first I was just kind of like, okay, great, awesome, fantastic. And um, then it just started like, just kind of settle in. And I was realizing, holy shit, I'm going to college on a full ride. It was incredible. It was a ticket, and I hate to say it like this, but it was a ticket out of poverty. My name is Bettina Gonzalez, and I'm a Quest Rich Scholar at Trinity College. Being a Quest Rich Scholar means I was offered a full ride scholarship to attend an elite institution due to my merits as a low income, high achieving student. To many, including myself and my family at first, getting the scholarship was a fairy tale. It was a story of triumph against all odds. But the story doesn't really end there. Being a low income, first generation student in an elite institution, the odds are still stacked against you. So my name is Angel Perez. I'm the Vice President for Enrollment and Student Success at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. There's a lot of different kinds of issues that first-generation mm -hmm. students at colleges and universities in the U.S. face. I would start with just transition. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of knowledge that I would say that first-generation students don't necessarily have because their parents or family members haven't gone through this process. We consider students to be first generation if either of their parent did not attend and graduate from a four-year institution. And then low income is a little bit more difficult to tell. Um, I think, you know, to a certain extent, we all have debates about what it means to be low income. But I would say that students who receive close to a full financial aid award from Trinity College funding most of their education are low income. You know, Trinity, obviously, small liberal arts college uh, with students coming from all over the country and all over the world, but still has a northeast feel to it. Like most small liberal arts colleges, we are a majority white institution, 20-something percent students of color, I think. I'm going to talk from a personal experience because I was a first-generation student to college. You know, we were not the kinds of students who grew up in an environment where we knew exactly who to go to for help or what the resources were. So for example, when I got uh, to a small liberal arts college in upstate New York, um, you know, the first impression that I had was maybe this place is not for me because there were not a lot of students who were Latino, who were low income and from the projects of the South Bronx. Every system that you become a part of has a rhythm and I was just trying to figure out what that rhythm was. How do you succeed in college? How do you get good grades? What is it that professors are actually really looking for? What are the resources on campus that are going to help me succeed? I didn't necessarily know what that was. I also felt, because I came from a low-income background and I attended a, a pretty poor public school in New York City, I just walked around my first year feeling like there was all this stuff that people knew that I didn't know. You know, I remember someone talking about the canon in English class, and I kept thinking, like, what is a canon? I kept thinking, is that a canon that explodes? And No, they were actually talking about literature, and they were talking about books 
that they had read in class in ninth and 10th grade that I had not necessarily read. And so part of it is the conflict that you feel between the resources that you feel people have and the leg up that they have in the system. Um, you know, social scientists call it cultural and social capital. I just did not have that cultural and social capital going in. First generation low income students coming to college always believe there's something going on that I don't know and I don't really belong here. But the reality is that you do belong because as a dean of admission, I can tell you that if we admitted you, you belong here 100%. Coming from an underprivileged background, I struggled to find my place at Trinity. I felt alien, but I couldn't be the only one feeling this way. There were other low-income, first-generation students. So I sought them out, not only from Trinity, but also other nearby elite colleges and universities. I sat down with these students to see what they had to say, to see if their stories mirrored my own. The students here, who this institution is built for, is basically predominantly white students. So all these systems that they have in place, they're kind of um, aimed towards them because they know how kind of what environment they've grown up in, what like they've go gone through. But when you try to bring in someone who hasn't experienced or hasn't grown up with that environment, then mm -hmm. that's where like these issues come in. If I feel like in a sense, if we were to be integrated kind of equally, it would kind of we would they would have to get our perspective on like how do we work because it's not they've grown up with a whole different experience than we have. There was a, a definite culture shock coming here. We're, by and large, uh, an extremely elite uh, society, like this little uh, like box that's here. Because these people uh, have some sense of uh, like virtue, that they came from money, that they can contribute to the classes here, um, that we deserve it less. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen that evidence in a couple of ways here, um, which I would say have been like more um, aggressive. Like I've heard people when drunk say, um, I like to flaunt my money so that I can make the poor people uncomfortable around here. Yeah, when I first came, I was, I don't know, I was like, okay, I'm here to get my education, whatever, whatever, I'm like, just work. And then like, I don't know, like suddenly I was just like, like all these smiles are like empty, like, I don't know, I just like broke down in the half, like the first half of the first semester here. And like, I didn't understand why, but I just like, I like slowly came to realize like all my fellow group, like they were just like white upper class girls. Yeah. And they're like, every like meet is like, let's go out, let's go eat here and da 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 da. And I'm just like, well, I, bye guys. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't got no like that. When I go to events and like, People are like just living up with their expensive ass suits and like posting pictures of like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna go to like Paris for a weekend. Like, yes. it's true. <laughs> like, I don't, like, I just know, like, Sorry. I'm not a part of that. Last year, it was my freshman year, um, I got on campus, my mom left, I was like all alone. I joined the crew team, which is like mostly white upper class people. Um, I have been around that my whole life, so I wasn't really uncomfortable, but um, the varsity girls would like invite us to stuff, like parties and stuff. There was some sort of tailgating event, I think it was maybe homecoming or something. They had like a morning thing where they got like 50 bottles of champagne, and we were like, they're like, morning mimosas and bagels, and I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> it was a lot. Whoa. And it, they were just like sitting on the counter, and I was like, <laughs> and they're like, just like Venmo us the money. And That's I was probably like, worth more than my car. Yeah, no. I was like, I was they're like, just Venmo us money. And I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I will not be participating. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it was just, uh, I think it's not subtle, it's very obvious. My first year was really difficult in that I threw myself into all that I was doing here. Um, I was a part of eight different orgs and just driving myself absolutely nuts, trying to be happy and reconstruct an identity that did not exist before coming here. Um, especially with being lower income and queer and black and femme in this very white space, um, very wealthy space, very 
ironically male-dominated space at a historically women's college. To me, made me really aware of the intersection of race and class. Um, I went to a charter school and it was really racially diverse. Like, being a minority was not associated with being low income. You had Indians and Pakistanis and um, Koreans. and The question of what your, your um, economic background never really came into question. So it was only when I came to Trinity that I saw such a stark divide between the, the white upper class and the minorities. The way that the admissions process works, at least in my opinion, is it forces people who are vastly different from one another into a very confined space and hopes that they'll interact well. But really what happens is that oil stays with oil and water stays with water. I feel like in some instances I've broken that barrier and in others I've stayed away from it. Like I was talking to someone who's like, I can't name 20 students who aren't of color that I'm friends with or that I know by name, really. And that, that was shocking to me. So like, going back to what you are saying, yeah, people, water sticks with water and oil sticks with oil. But also, I don't know if it's something I'm not doing in the classroom or something that's structural about Trinity. And I don't know like if y'all can comment on this, <coughs> if you think it's structural or do you think that it's... Because mm -hmm. I do know like the whole thing is like, why do the black kids all sit on one side of the cafeteria or why do white kids all sit on one side of the cafeteria? And obviously you do see intermingling, like especially with athletics. Um, you'll see a lot of athletes of all races, all socioeconomic classes sitting in their little track team and the basketball team, football team, whatever it may be. Um, but I do feel that students of color may feel uncomfortable approaching white students in Mather in the classroom or whatever it may be because they feel racialized, like they feel like their race is going to be the forefront of the conversation and that a white person couldn't get past that um, or they couldn't get past their class. That was like my wake up call because like low key when I first got here I was like oh, I made it and then like like there was like one day like a, like two weeks in and then like someone was like shout out to the girl who spoke the truth she said like black people are poor because they don't work and i was like oh yeah i am black haha you almost got me right uh, i was like <laughs> what i was like yeah oh yeah i am black sorry you know people do and believe all these things all the time which doesn't mitigate like our experiences but i think it's even more shocking that like you know, you do realize that these things happen here too. We can see the numbers of our friends and fellow classmates that are battling depression, battling anxiety because, and they vocally say like, I feel like I don't fit in here or I don't feel comfortable at this school because they don't see people that look like them. They don't see programs geared towards them. Whenever I do like contribute and I talk about like where I'm from and everything, I can't help but feel like the people in my class are annoyed. But like, yes. Yeah. Yes. Like, yes. They, they probably think I'm just another person of color complaining about like not having money yeah. and like complaining about the lack of diversity here. But like, it's something that's really important to me. Yet, I, I, I feel like they think it's wasting their time when I talk about it. I'm the only person of color in my English class. I don't feel comfortable in that class, and like, they're all friends with each other, and they like go out to eat lunch after class, and I like. I feel really left out and I feel like I can't relate to that and I can't talk to them. And then that definitely like inhibits me during class, like it prevents me from contributing to class too because I feel like whatever I say won't sound as smart or like won't be in their language. Sort of coming from the same situation where I went to a high school that was, it wasn't the worst in St. Louis by far, but it did not prepare me academically for Trinity. Um, I was one of the top students at my schools, like had over a 4.0, but at the same time, like if you compare like my school's curriculum to the other schools, like boarding schools, or many of the other feeder schools that feed into Trinity, my academics were not anywhere as close to them um, as far as college preparatory. Um, and so I feel like when you grow up or go to a school that has similar sources to Trinity, like you you sort of grow up or get used to a certain level, level of academics as well as a lot of help. Um, and growing up in a place where you're taught to be very independent um, and sort of fight for things on your own, they may be like, oh, there is tutoring. But like, I know one student said like, oh, I thought you had to pay for tutoring. Um, so it's just things like that. So like, 
Okay, so I went to a public school, and it's not, like, we ha had APs, but it wasn't, like, preparing you, like, to get a five. It was just, like, I don't know. It, it was just, it, w it didn't really prepare us at all. And I came, and I was like, okay, you know, like, I'm pre-med, I gotta take chemistry. So, like, I went to, like, the meeting, and the all the professors were like, oh, have you ever took, like, AP Chem, and you got a one? You're gonna be fine going to Chem 125, which is, like, an acceler accelerated, like, chem class. Like, it's, like, a year-long chem, but all in one semester. And he said it was fine, you're gonna be fine, but, like, you're, like, like you, what you're thinking about is, like, students who, like, went to, like, high schools that had, like, gr really great teachers who were, like, preparing them for, like, really preparing them and then I know that a lot of students like followed the advices of these like professors at Vassar and they went and got into Chem 125 and failed and like did terrible and I yeah so I just like they don't take in consideration of our background of right. our education you know a lot of my friends who graduated with me from high school yeah like they some of them are still in school but like many of them are not in school why because they don't have those resources that some other people may have. So in a sense, like, I was able to kind of, like, make it out of that, but they weren't. And then I'm, I'm still here, but I still don't know everything that I need to know. I mean, that just goes right back to accommodation. Don't bring me here if you don't want to accommodate me. When I tell you that I don't like all these white kids in my hall and that I feel unsafe and uncomfortable, yes. listen to yes. me. Yes. My yes. hall is yeah. almost yeah. entirely yeah. white. You know, like, that's chill, but, like, they don't respect me. I don't have time for that. Well, when I came here, they were playing, like, rap through the bass, through speaker. And I swear, I swear some of the kids said the N-word when they were singing along. I'm like, oh, they do that all the time. And I'm just like, I was like, and, like, I came out, they're loud, obnoxious, sexist, racist. If I, if I knock on the door and, like, say one thing that they say, I'll be in trouble. And it makes no sense. Like, why? Like, why is that? You know, it makes no sense. It's like, why can't I, like, you know, like, it's just annoying. It's like, why can't I, like, why can't they, like, instead of being obnoxious and, like, making people sleep to a point, it's just like, I can't do anything about it at this point. Like, because if I do say stuff like that and I get written up, who's there to, like, vouch for me? Nobody. Apparently, like, they want to be more diverse, but yet you don't have these resources here that diversity needs and will facilitate, like, the success of all of our students. Like, if you want to bring students here who are from less privileged backgrounds, well, you better be damn straight that we got the resources we need to be just as successful. Like, they want us to mold to like this white space, and yet you want this white space to become more diversified. Like, you don't make sense. I don't really know where I fit in among like all the different dynamics, and then like coming here, like I don't really know if I can talk about how well I've integrated because I've only been here for like two and a half months. But I came here with like. I still don't know how to feel about all the stuff that has happened to me in the past. And so I struggle with like feeling guilty for feeling angry, but then knowing I should feel angry. And like, I don't really know how to take care of myself mentally because there are nights here, or there are like long periods of time here where I realize like I'm not happy. And so I don't really know how to integrate well. I've been trying to figure out how to stay positive. Um, one of my closest friends recently took the rest of the year off, like this past Monday. And the night before, like two days before she left, we had this long conversation on the phone. And she said that um, being here is just so difficult. And some people can take it, some people can't. Um, I'm still trying to figure out whether I can. Being a low-income student at an elite institution is very unusual and almost paradoxical. What often happens is that you fall between the cracks of two different worlds. The poor, or your family, and the elite, your institution. Family is always central. Even before school, it was important that basically our cousins are our friends. <laughs> it was really encouraged that we went out and did things. So when I did apply to Questbridge and told them, you guys are applying early decision to school in Connecticut. Um, they, I got it, and they were actually appalled. They were like, "You're leaving us." Sort of. Um, so, yeah. So my family came here in 1992, settled in San Jose, California, and all my life, my parents have never made more than ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year, and this is to support a family of six. I live with. Um, my three siblings, uh, two of which are twins, they're all younger than me, all brothers, um, 
my mom and my stepdad. I grew up with both of my parents and they worked my entire life, um, first in parking jobs and gas stations, um, and then they were able to open their own um, coin laundry. I'm from a very close-knit Mexican family in San Diego, California. Uh, my mom was a single mother and she only had me. So my home life uh, has always been uh, just me and my mom and my brother. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was really young um, and we actually ended up moving in with uh, my grandmother. My mom is disabled and so she can't work, she's unemployed so we didn't have an income and because of everything that's happened, she's clinically depressed. Uh, my mom doesn't work. Uh, she can be pretty sickly at times. Uh, and uh, my stepdad uh, recently got a, a better job, but before that, we didn't have a lot of money coming in. Going to college was not an easy decision for me. They had already sent, my parents had already sent both of my older brothers to college and really didn't know how they were going to support another child in college. I really thought I was going to get a job after high school or go to community college. And it was thanks to Clusbridge that I found a way um, to finance college without having to rely on my parents. What I didn't expect was how hard being college and thinking about what a college education means to me, like those are very like difficult processes too. Um, because on the one hand, my parents, my family, have sacrificed so much for me to be here, and I want to honor that decision. Um, I remember I was driving my car, and my mom called me, and um, she told me I got in, and I was like so happy, and then I got home, and I was like, I have to move to Connecticut. And like being from such like a small family, like my mom and my brother, I've been so close my entire life, I was like, torn apart. I was like, I, I need to go, I want to go, but it's so far away. I don't know how I'm going to do it. And I'm the youngest of my family, so me leaving to Vassar was leaving her all alone. And so that definitely like brings up feelings of selfishness, like being here. And, you know, because of my mom's like mental condition, she has like gone off on me sometimes calling me selfish. On one point, they want this for me. They want me to be successful. Like, this is a good thing, but at the same time, it's like, like, yeah, it's the conflict, it's this guilt of like, I'm here and I have like a buffet for a meal. And like, I'm yeah. home and like, I get texts from home and like, they're like, oh yeah, everything's fine. But I know it's like leftovers in the fridge and like peanut butter and jelly for like school every day for my brothers. And it's this conflict and just to see people here who yeah. have like, Freaking like their parents are paying for their tuition and their brother's tuition and then like they're like complaining and yeah. like it's just like what like do you not realize like it's it's just frustrating. I know that my mom has a really hard time financially but I'm also in a bit of a I guess sticky situation because um, like how you want to help but you also really can't because like you have to you know be here and focus and study and trying to explain that to professors and deans and whom, who um, have not experienced that is um, extremely difficult where like I'll, like I'll tell them, you know, I can't do work because I'm too worried about my parents. Well, so I, I with work study, like I got two different jobs and I was working a lot, but then I was also making like good money and stuff. And so, and it was kind of easy for me to do that. Like, and the jobs weren't difficult at all. And like it was kind of hard like not having a lot of time to study and stuff like that but I felt kind of bad that it was just easy for me to do that when I know back home like it's really hard to get a job and like my family is struggling with money. There's one thing I kind of want to resonate with Hosanna side is um, when she was like when your parents said everything's alright because every, every time I call my mom which I don't often because I kind of shut her off because I don't want to deal with all that problems um, which is kind of bad but I um, mean it's not kind of but whenever I do a car very infrequently the first thing she asked me is if I eat and it's kind of sad to know that, like, to know that like, they're struggling with that at home. And she's asking me if I eat when I have, like, a roof over my head. Um, how, what am I doing? Like, how am I going to be able to take this clothing experience back home? How is this going to affect my family? Because uh, throughout the year, they'll call and they'll say, oh, we weren't able to have dinner tonight. So you have, like, $10 so you can have to go to or something like that. Definitely, I do that. But who can I talk to about that here? And I do kind of like just hold that in and I'll keep that to myself or I'll call my sister or a family member who 
who's off campus, they're not in this area. Uh, so when I am here, it's it's bit it's bits and pieces rather than the full me, and that's I'm not resentful about it anyway. Uh, I really do enjoy it here, but it is a little discouraging not to be able to bring your bring all of me. I didn't like academically. I knew I was fine. Like academic, I knew like I could do all of this, but socially. And culturally, I thought I was going to do well, but I didn't, and I fell apart. And and it was hard. It was hard and hard finding myself because I had to go through a lot of stuff. This made no sense to me, like how I'm in an easier place, but it's harder to live. Being a low-income student is, is it, it, there's, it's like a puzzle right now. Um, how to navigate that sort of identity and then what to do with it if all of a sudden income does come in uh, through college but then past college like if you achieve success like is the low income is low income part of you still there what that conflict has manifested in is should i become like a lawyer like a pretty stable lucrative traditional job or should I be a writer, which I've always thought about, you know, as I cycled through careers. So I haven't always been set on being a lawyer. I've been like, oh, should I be a doctor? Should I be a programmer? Should I be an academic? Should I be a lawyer? But all this time I've been thinking, oh, but I will write at night. And it's always been this deferral of what I want to do. A lot of, I notice that a lot of income students who come to Vassar are usually pre-med, so, uh, like into the sciences. And I, I, I feel that they're excluding themselves, like they're not believing in themselves that they can do what they really want to major in. They don't realize that that you are given this, like you go to Vassar College, this like, you know, at least institution, you are worth it. You can major anything you want. And I just feel angry that other like privileged like white children are like told this at this school and they feel so comfortable they're like an art major <coughs> a film major they're doing all these they're like confident that i can do i can succeed and get out of this place do that but a lot of students uh, of like low income come here they they don't re like they can't see that within themselves you know with other low income students for sure students that have connected with this seems to be a nice community, but there's also a nice people want or wonder um, about if there's like something more out there, something that we're missing out on because we're aware that uh, there is more there, uh, and it's puzzling on um, how do we attain it? Do we want to attain it? Uh, how do we go about doing that? There is nothing for me to go back to. There isn't. I mean, I mean, as a, like a first generation student, I don't like. There's no to do what how I want to live my life. Like without education, I can't do that. Like I, 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 I'm, I don't have connections. I am not. You know, I'm not wealthy. I don't. I can't just travel the world and discover myself. And I guess this is the only opportunity I have to do that. Is that faster? But, I mean, I also stay because of access to food every day mm -hmm. and warmth. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, even knowing that I'm privileged because I have a house at home, even though it's a full house with my grandparents, my mom, and my brother, and my cousin, um, like, I have my own room when I'm here. Like, I don't have to share a room. I have yeah. my own space. Something that I had to fight for when I came here. One thing is I want to graduate and get my mom a house. We never had a house. We never, like, we've never lived in a house. And for 10 years, we've never had a stable home. And I realized I want to buy her a house because it means a lot for her. Happiness and sadness have been fleeting, both of them. Like, they can be in the same space or one will be gone for just a second and be the most intense like depression I've had. Um, and then, you know, a couple weeks later I just like forget about it because something great happened in the college. Uh, 
Uh, I'm still like trying to understand like why that is, uh, whether or not like the consistency in feeling is like a normal thing to have, like being a low-income student at Columbia. It's definitely, it doesn't end like once you get accepted to college, like, okay, I've made it, like, things are going to be good. It's going to be like a constant struggle. Like, even though you're f first generation, low income, and like you broke the barrier of getting into college, like, it's still going to be tough for like the rest of the way. And you just got to continue to be resilient like you've had your whole life. When you finally come to the realization that you are deeply unhappy here and you have to figure out how do you stay grounded, um, you can stay within that sort of mindset where you're happy all the time and you constantly force yourself to be in these communities that are not welcoming to you, or you can choose to be, I guess, conscious and, um, and be aware and be self-aware of what you're putting yourself through. And when you make the latter choice to know yourself and to ground yourself and to not fall into these spaces that are not healthy for you, um, you are making a choice that you will have to put up with until you graduate and even thereafter. And I've made that choice to be self-aware mm -hmm. and to know myself. Um, and it's a choice that comes with a lot of baggage. I know that I'm not the only one experiencing these issues. I've found a community that agrees with me, maybe not on every single thing, but we agree that Trinity is not a healthy community for minority low-income students. There is no immediate solution to address the struggles of first-generation low-income students. But if there's one thing that I've learned over the past four years is that we need to talk about these issues. You know, after doing all those interviews, I've the one lesson I learned was that people need to talk and people need to be heard. This is something that collectively we all experience and we need to share that with each other to feel some sense of community that this isn't, you're not actually alone. There are people here who are like you. There might not be a lot, but we're here. Forget the shame, forget feeling like you're all alone. I felt those things too and I was wrong. It's not just me, it's all of us. Thank you, thank you so much for coming and listening to us. Yeah. <laughs> People are amazing.